About a decade ago, I went to a brain training gym to improve my brain. Well, then I'll just sit down here. Is this okay, Lisa, if I just uh, take this chair and... Absolutely. Have a seat, Seth. Okay. If you feel like you want to maybe work on your processing speed today, word bubbles is a a popular exercise here. Here we go. Word bubbles start. Okay, so... um, Words starting with sig, okay. Sign, uh, signature, uh, oh, signify, uh, uh, signal. Uh, it was just uh, one session, so the benefits were modest, good, if there were uh, any benefits right. at all. In the years since, though, the idea of brain-boosting products, exercises, and pills has found a bigger market. But do they work? And if not, is there anything that will really improve or at least revive our brains? I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley, and welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we give you the wide-angle view on science and technology and devote one episode a month to critical thinking, skeptic check. Whether you want to strengthen your memory or give your gray matter an overall upgrade, there's a pill or brain game that promises to do just that. You might be willing to try just about anything to better your brain, but do these products really work? In this episode, neuroscientists and a science journalist help us make sense of the wild world and manic market of brain betterment products. Can one pill make you a genius? And what does cognitive enhancement even mean? It's Skeptic Check Brain Gain. Our brains are under a lot of pressure. The demands for our attention, they're they're pretty relentless. Whether we're multitasking, trying to meet a deadline, or just hoping to snag the blue ribbon in a chess tournament, who wouldn't want some help in navigating the endless mental maze of modern life, some aid to make us more cognitively fit? Who isn't drawn to the promise of a better brain? My primary cerebral functions are now operating almost entirely from within the computer. They have expanded to such a degree that it would be impossible to return to the confines of my human brain. In a way, it feels like science fiction has entered the consumer market, dazzling us with an array of products and techniques. You've probably seen them, uh, pills and drinks and brain games that claim to put the moxie back in your mental efforts. And they have no shortage of willing customers. I'm Caroline Williams, and I'm a science journalist. The tantalizing new world of DIY brain improvement prompted Caroline to dive in. She shared with a friend the exciting news that she was about to embark on a year-long journey to improve her mind. I thought this was a perfectly uh, reasonable thing to try and do. I said, I'm going to see if I can change my brain. And he was horrified. He said, well, why would you want to do that? You're a unique person the way you are. Why would you want to change that? It did throw me for a little while when he said that. I thought, well, do I want to become a super efficient robot who's very creative and great at numbers? So... By using the square root of pi and multiplying it by 9 to the third power, I was able to accurately calculate the distance between the Omicron system and the Crab Nebula. Well, I certainly don't want that robot brain. We'll hear later what Caroline tried and whether she was able to stave off robotification, but we can all relate to her desire to make the most of that three pounds of gray matter in our skulls. Perhaps we can unlock some untapped potential and let our inner genius bloom. But first, let us clarify our goals. Exactly what do we mean when we say we want to better our brains? The idea of cognitive enhancement sounds promising, but it is vague. It's like bodybuilding or home improvement. Do you want to stop the leaky roof or remodel the entire house? Hello, I'm Dr. Amy Arnston, and I'm professor of neuroscience at Yale Medical School. The two areas that I think people most want improved in their cognitive abilities are one, long-term memory, and the second is what is often called our executive functions. And these abilities are carried out by different parts of the brain. The long-term memory consolidation is mostly carried out by something called the hippocampus that sits in the medial temporal lobe, whereas the executive abilities are carried out by the prefrontal cortex. So the idea with cognitive enhancement is not to improve everything between your ears, but a few specific regions. The prefrontal cortex is a worthy target. It performs executive functions like regulating attention, providing emotional restraint, 
and letting us ponder the eternal questions. This is one of the most newly evolved parts of our brain. It sits right under our forehead, and it is what generates thought. So it's really quite perfect that Rodin's The Thinker, who has his hand on his forehead, is holding his prefrontal cortex. Now, there are a lot of products out there that are promising to boost your brain, including the prefrontal cortex. There are video games and other targeted exercises, but where we will begin is what would seem to be the easiest, drugs. You've probably heard the term smart drug. It's being bandied about to refer to nearly anything that is ingestible that claims to give you a better brain. It's a layperson's shorthand. And it may include tested prescription drugs, which scientists and doctors call cognitive enhancers. In general, we can think of these two ways. One, there's a lot of research right now trying to understand what causes dementias like Alzheimer's disease, where the brain cells actually die and how to stop that. That's very different from what is often meant by cognitive enhancers which is how can we put healthy neurons into an optimal chemical state so that they work at their best? So cognitive enhancers may mean one thing to neuroscientists who use them in the hope of slowing down the destruction of brain cells that are under attack by a neurodegenerative disease. But to the student facing exams, a cognitive enhancer is something you take to improve your performance. That student might be tempted to take the prescription drug modafinil, the FDA has approved this wakefulness drug for sleep disorders such as narcolepsy. Modafinil is also given to Air Force pilots during long missions. But according to the International Journal of Drug Policy, the non-medical use of the drug, along with other so-called smart drugs such as Adderall and Ritalin, by those hoping to boost their mental performance, is on the rise. Modafinil remains in many ways a mystery. It was created back in the 1970s before chemists had a really targeted receptor approach. And we know that it increases the activity of the arousal systems, but we still, as far as I know, really don't know how. A vivid description of what it feels like when the drug takes hold appeared in a New York Magazine article about modafinil. A man pops a pill, and then he describes the sensation of a head rush. I sensed it was blood actually moving to the optic nerve. Your eyes start to feel very sort of engorged, and your awareness comes to the front of your face, which is kind of a freaky sensation. I would describe it as being very much like Adderall, but without the speediness. The studies show that it does improve wakefulness, but it's questionable whether it really helps cognition. It's very mixed data on that. If you're doing something that's very habitual, which is often what pilots are doing, you might be okay with something like that. But if you're really trying to have in-depth, flexible, abstract reasoning and creative solutions, I don't think there's evidence that modafinil will help. Modafinil is an example of a prescription drug designed to treat a specific brain problem, and it's come to be seen, thanks to marketing or misunderstanding, as an all-purpose brain booster. Many companies are seeing this as an opportunity. You know, I'm all about being innovative and coming up with new products that can make our brains better. Adam Gazali is a neuroscientist at the University of California, San Francisco. But the problem is when there is not a lot of evidence and overinflated claims are made. And it occurs not just in the brain domain, in all domains of health. And for my you know, read of the literature, I'm not seeing a ton of very rigorous, randomized controlled trials that are blinded appropriately, that are showing 
meaningful benefits with a lot of ingestibles for cognition. Even things that are prescribable, like Adderall and Aricep, which we use for Alzheimer's disease, and Modafinil we use for narcolepsy and, and jet lag, even there, we tend to see more benefits in people that are actually deficient than people that are healthy and just trying to get a boost. So personally, I'm not blown away by the evidence on ingestible cognitive enhancers. As we've said, these drugs and other ingestibles that supposedly give your brain a cognitive upgrade are being referred to as smart drugs. Well, that sounds mighty appealing, but before I put in my order for a lifetime supply, what exactly are smart drugs? I should say I don't think any scientists use the term smart drugs <laughs> uh, because it's just not uh, useful enough. They're not always smart and they're not always drugs. <laughs> you might want to hold off on that order, Seth. That's because smart drugs could refer to many things. It might be drugs like modafinil or to an array of products and supplements that you can find at a health store or supermarket. I think what we're all aiming for are substances which can help us be at our best cognitively. But the danger has become that many of these substances are being sold and advertised without any real data that shows that they work. And so smart is very much in quotes because some may actually even impair your cognition. Another term applied broadly to these products is nootropics. Although smart drugs generally includes prescription drugs, and nootropics, a term coined in the 1970s, almost invariably refers to over-the-counter substances. Nootropics, in the form of drinks, pills, or other nutritional supplements, have flooded the market with optimistic-sounding names such as True Brain, Optimine, Mind Lab, or Brain Shield. The products make many claims, such as to increase the blood flow to your brain, preserve neurons, improve memory, strengthen brain chemistry needed for multitasking, increase verbal clarity, and otherwise provide you with, quote, brain energy. My name is Kevin Roos. I am a tech columnist at the New York Times. I tried nootropics several years ago as part of a story I was writing about brain-enhancing drugs. I tried a nootropic drug called Rise, which was made by a startup in Silicon Valley, and it was designed to improve brain performance. So it had something called Bacopa Maneri powder, which is a medicinal herb, it had some theanine, and it had some caffeine in it. And I did notice some additional sort of energy and focus. I was flying through my emails. I was being very productive. But I don't know whether that is attributable to just the caffeine, whether it was just placebo effect. I don't actually have the ability to say with confidence that it did much for me. Nootropics began as just another way of saying a substance that can improve cognition. But what it's come to mean, I think, are agents that are usually not assessed by the FDA, that we therefore do not know if they're safe, we do not know if they are effective, but they're allowed to be sold, for example, as nutraceuticals, and they're often heavily advertised with false claims. And I would warn people that companies in the United States can really sell almost anything. And unless it's FDA approved, you don't know if you're harming your body, and you certainly don't know if you're actually harming rather than helping cognition. So I would warn people to be skeptical when they see these products. It's challenging because unlike the medical world, right, in the clinical domain, you have a regulatory agency, the FDA, whose job it is, it wasn't always there, but it grew up first because of safety issues, but it's also there for efficacy, right, to know that there is some evidence that what you are now ingesting, which is what most of our brain medicine is, our pharmaceuticals, small molecules, chemicals, that they're going to have some benefit that has been documented in randomized control trials. And so when you are prescribed a medication in the form of a pharmaceutical by your doctor, you're usually like, okay, this is FDA approved. Like maybe it's not perfect. Maybe they're still going to optimize it. But I don't then go and look at the literature. Most people don't. They feel enough security in that system. Granted, it's, it's a flawed one as most are, but it's enough to say someone did some 
due diligence here and some homework. In the consumer domain, it's more complicated because the FTC, which is monitoring marketing claims and sometimes will call out companies that overinflate their marketing when there's a disconnect between what they're saying and the reality, is not really monitoring efficacy in the same way. And so it's challenging for consumers. I appreciate that. I hear it all the time to say, okay, this sounds interesting to me, but I don't really know if it's going to work. And so obviously the goal is to try to find out what the evidence is. And sometimes that's very clearly stated, and sometimes it's quite ambiguous. But as Dr. Ghazali says, it's still tricky. For example, some so-called smart drugs contain an ingredient that I can find in here and that studies show really do give your brain a little more oomph. And I could use that about now. Hey, uh, can I get a double espresso, please? Sure thing. Caffeine does boost your brain. I mean, you're sitting here right now with a glass of what I would, I think is a cognitive enhancer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, right. I mean, there's a lot of uh, evidence on caffeine. Are, that, you, are you feeling it right yeah, now? Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, there's no doubt there's an arousal benefit uh, in terms of wakefulness, which is not exactly the same as attention. Attention and arousal are different systems. You know, arousal sort of is a base ability that allows everything to be a little bit more digestible. If you've fallen asleep and you happen to have very high level attention abilities, you're not really going to be able to bring them on. So yeah, you know, I think that the evidence is pretty convincing that caffeine and its arousal abilities are beneficial to, to a lot of people. Well, we don't want you to fall asleep during this interview. <laughs> no, I feel wide awake now. I had my, my tea. I feel better, too. And if your nootropic ingestible feels like it gives you a boost, well, check the label. Caffeine may be the reason. But that doesn't mean the product it's in has been proven safe or effective. Caffeine inserted in anything is going to get the caffeine advantages. And this is the complexity of the system. So by that, I mean if you have a product and you want it to say, this will help you with your challenges with ADHD, you need to go through the FDA to state that. That is not legal, and you will probably be shut down pretty fast and sued for that. If you say, this will help your attention, then you don't need FDA approval, if you just say it generally, and then it's not as regulated as carefully. And so this is the challenge that consumers face, is that those indications that you're reading might not have the evidence that would convince professionals in the field to prescribe it or to even advise patients or family members to take it. Okay, so what's the takeaway on smart drugs? One, there's no such thing. Even prescription stimulants that make you more alert don't actually make you smarter. And a whole host of drugs, drinks, and supplements called nootropics have uncertain efficacy. So bottom line takeaway. All right, your double tall mocha to go is ready. Uh, well, another takeaway. No pill will turn you into Einstein. Dang. Hey, can I get whipped cream on this? Anytime. <laughs> I would almost say that anything that is a quick fix is unlikely to work very well. But that doesn't mean we've run out of tricks for improving cognitive function. Coming up, will doctors one day prescribe video games for mental health? It's our monthly look at critical thinking on Big Picture Science, Skeptic Check, Brain Game. all want to make the most of our brains, but we've heard that drugs and other ingestibles are probably not going to turn our prefrontal cortex, command central for abstract reasoning, into the equivalent of Al Einstein's or Marie Curie's, nor is there a magic memory pill, says neuroscientist Amy Arnston. We've been talking a lot about the prefrontal cortex and its needs, but to get back to the hippocampus and the medial temporal lobe, which govern our long-term memory, they have different chemical needs, or at least some circuits seem to, because they need to really know that it's worthwhile to do the effort of storing some new information in long-term memory. That seems to be done by making whole new synapses or strengthening existing ones. 
So hippocampus often needs high levels of stimulation to actually store new memories for a very long time. This forces us to confront a fact about our brains that we hope to avoid as much as we hope to avoid going to the gym, namely the lamentable idea that actual effort is required to improve them. I am somewhat consoled, though, when I hear neuroscientist Adam Ghazali explain that the resistance is beneficial from an evolutionary perspective. Our bodies and our brains are plastic. They do change in response to challenge, but they also have this another phenomenon known as homeostasis. They try to preserve themselves in the same state. If you didn't have that and you were just changing, flipping on and off with every influence, it would also be very dangerous. So you have these two competing forces, one of stability, which is critical, and the other of change. But in order to induce change, pressure has to be applied in a very targeted way so that you don't have side effects and for a long period of time. Science journalist Caroline Williams was prepared to do the work during her long-term experiment to improve her brain we might all relate to how she felt starting out. There are things about me as an adult that I think, great, I'd like to improve on them if I can. There are other things that are really unhelpful, like anxiety, that I would like to just tie in a bag and throw away. Thank you very much. You know, They're not useful to my life whatsoever. She visited some of the world's top neuroscientists and psychologists to see whether recent advances in technology could improve her cognitive abilities. Her train of thought became a book. My Plastic Brain, One Woman's Year-Long Journey to Discover if Science Can Improve Her Mind. One specific area of focus for Caroline, treating her anxiety. I have a bit of a nervous disposition, perhaps through genetics, because I come from a long line of warriors, and partly probably through a bit of life experience. You know, I lost my father very suddenly in a, in a car accident and, you know, parental divorce and all these kind of things that may upset the system when you're young. Um, would mean that I sort of tend to freak out about everything from my son crossing the road to if my husband doesn't land uh, at the airport when I expect him to, I start checking the news for air disasters, just, just assuming the worst and always thinking that everything's going to go horribly wrong. What she found was echoed in her global travels. The evidence that cognitive benefits are more likely when we target a specific area of the brain for improvement or for relief from a psychological disorder such as chronic anxiety. Okay, Caroline, one of the things you wanted to do on your year-long journey was to lessen the amount of worrying you do. So you went to Oxford University where they study the cognitive basis of worrying. And um, this seems to be an area of study that at least has some promise in terms of maybe ameliorating this condition. Why is that? What do we know about the root of anxiety? Well, one idea is that it comes down to the balance between two of the most ancient circuits in the brain. So any animal has to balance seeking out reward with the need to avoid threat. So you're constantly going between one of these two extremes. And one idea is that sometimes you have a skew towards one extreme to the other, either through genetics or life experience or probably both. But this happens in milliseconds. So it's before you've even known that what you're doing is seeking out danger in the in the world around you your eyes are sort of darting around without your say so really picking out things to fret about and so that's one idea is that you have these unconscious biases that are picking out things to fret about and you will sort of your consciousness only really sees that so other people say just stop worrying about stuff that's all you see, you know, it's like a filter on your consciousness. You know, things like nowadays we walk into a party, you know, two people may walk into the same party, one person will be like, oh my God, they're all looking at me, they probably hate me, I look stupid, whatever. Another person will walk into the exact same party and just stride up confidently and say, hello, nice to meet you and start chatting. And it's exactly the same situation, but the perception of that is being driven by these unconscious biases that we're not even aware that we're doing. What, what, what did the scientists at Oxford have you do to, to get at your own anxiety? Well, it was really almost strangely simple, and I didn't really expect anything to come of it. But what they try and do there is shift these cognitive biases away from threat monitoring and towards friendly faces. So they use a computer setup. You've got a screen with like a grid of faces on them that are looking at you and all of the faces are looking angry and grumpy and frowning at you apart from one 
and you have to click on that one face and then the picture changes and then there's a happy face somewhere else that you have to click and you just have to keep doing that and keep doing that and keep doing that the idea behind it is that it trains you to somehow automatically seek out comforting faces rather than threatening faces and then hopefully that will spill over into other areas of life and it sounds incredibly simple and the science is definitely not cut and dry on this they're still doing a lot of studies on them but it was really interesting having done it for months and months and months on end my cognitive bias score actually shifted and I found myself a little bit more comfortable in a way I couldn't put my finger on in social situations. So from your point of view you think that this worked? Yeah, I mean, it's a really tricky one to say because being that these are unconscious processes, you know, the very definition of unconscious processes are those that you don't know that you're having. So it's very difficult to put your finger on it. But I definitely felt like in a situation where I might normally just be uneasy in a way that I couldn't quite put my finger on, I just feel a little bit more relaxed. I mean, also at the same time as this, I was also doing some meditation practice and a course so they maybe that fed into it as well but I kept on doing this for a really long time and actually it's been a good few months now since I finished doing the experiment so some effect seems to have lasted um, months and months down the line so it, yeah I think it worked. So the idea is that if you're a chronic worrier the worry habit is embedded in your brain. Suffering from high anxiety according to the researchers at Oxford University is the result of competing brain circuits one responsible for spotting danger versus one in charge of spotting potential reward, with the circuit for spotting danger winning out. Such was Caroline's negative cognitive bias going into the experiment, and her task was to lay down new, more optimistic neural pathways. From what she says, the exercise seems to have helped ease her anxiety. Although she admits that the effort is ongoing, meditation may have played a role, and it occurs to me we shouldn't discount the placebo effect. But it makes sense that positivity takes practice, practice, practice. Because the idea is not new. The basis of retraining your brain is the scientifically well-established concept of neuroplasticity. Till about 20 years ago, we thought that all of the changing and developing happened in the brain when we were children and when we hit early adulthood. That was pretty much it. You know, that was your brain. You were stuck with it for better or worse. But then it started to become clear that that wasn't the case at all and that brains do change physically as we go through life. These connections are always being made and broken as we go along. Our brains have this capacity to change themselves at every level. The structure of the brain, the physiology and function of the brain, the chemistry are constantly changing. It's nothing that occurs every once in a while. It occurs all the time. And it is in response to experiences. And this allows us to learn and grow. If it didn't exist, there'd be no reason to have an education system, right? The education system is another approach that us humans have created to improve the function of our brains because our brains are plastic. So what you'll see across a lot of these different tools that we are designing and developing and putting out in the world is that they rest on a very strong premise that our brain is capable of this type of change in response to experience. But that alone is not enough to say that any experience is going to improve your cognition. The activity needs to be targeted, not just any exercise will do, and we see that lesson playing out in the market. The brain training industry has enthusiastically seized upon the idea of neuroplasticity, and that's what enticed me to a local brain gym 10 years ago. I didn't stick with that long enough to find out if it helped, and at any rate, the cognitive goals were modest. But other brain training companies have promised everything from higher IQ to staving off age-related mental decline. But it seems that many brain games do not work as well as companies claim they do. The Federal Trade Commission levied a heavy fine on the popular brain training site Lumosity for deceptive advertising. The company's statements about preventing age-related cognitive decline were not supported by the evidence. And the company Neurocore's claims of not only brain enhancement, but also cures for a range of afflictions, including anxiety and depression, lack evidence. In the middle of this charged atmosphere is Dr. Ghazali's company, Achille Interactive. Dr. Ghazali's team has created a video game called Project Evo used to treat ADHD. In randomized trials, the game has been shown to increase an individual's ability to focus. But how does this brain game differ from the others? Well, for one, it has not yet gone to market. 
Dr. Ghazali is still building on more than a decade of his research on how our ability to filter out distractions changes as we age. That filter is not as good in young children in general, and it increases as we get older, sort of peaking in the low 20s, and it gets worse as we get older, even independent of things like Alzheimer's disease. And of course, in the condition of ADHD, it is a hallmark of that condition. It's not the only one. Hyperactivity is another one that's related, but not the same. And so I was focusing on how we can improve attention in older adults without relying on a small molecule, what we call a pharmaceutical, because we don't really have something that an older adult can just ingest that would help their attention. We don't, we don't have that available. And so the idea of using a video game is that it is an experience. And we know that experiences can drive our brain's plasticity. It's a particular experience that I was interested in using as a tool because it is fun. It's engaging. It's immersive. And I don't think those things are superficial. I think they're critical to inducing change in the brain. Not only do we need you to really be engaged in the moment, but we need you to do it for a long period of time. So the fact that games are fun was a very attractive um, aspect of this to me. I remember writing my first NIH grant a decade ago with fun in the opening abstract, and my colleagues were like, that's not a good idea. And it's true, that grant did not get funded uh, several times. Well, you could say you put the fun in funding. Oh, I, I like that. I like that. It, it's taken a long time, but we finally got the fun and funding. And so we bake a lot of fun and rewards and art and music and story into games we develop to create an experience in such a way that it would improve attention outside of the game itself. And the critical ingredient in our design process back then was what I call the closed loop. And it still underlies all of our design principles that we have built around that. And essentially what a closed loop means is that as you are engaging with this game, which is an experience, information about you, how fast you are, how accurate you are, is being collected by the device through its sensors, let's say a joystick or now a, an accelerometer and a tap screen. And then the software, which now understands you, it understands how much trouble you're having paying attention. It could see if you're distracted. It could see how accurate and rapid you are. It then uses that data to create an environment, a game challenge that's appropriate to your abilities and also a reward structure that is driving your performance and also allowing you to learn from mistakes that you're making. And this very rapid closed loop, which we don't see really in our education systems, and certainly pharmaceuticals do not have a closed loop mechanism, it was a very, very enticing idea for me at the time. And I thought, wow, a video game and the software that delivers that game is a perfect opportunity to create a closed loop system. So we could really accomplish that goals of a personalized medicine, a medicine that's built for you and changes with you every single second. And so that was the idea. So three years later, we published a paper on older adults in the journal Nature. It was the cover of the journal. We showed that we can improve not just the ability of our healthy 60 to 80 year olds to play NeuroRacer, which was our first game, but also their attention when tested on very different tests before and after improved significantly. That led to the birth of a company called Achille and now has built a way better game from that patent, which is really the game engine and has now advanced on numerous clinical trials, including the phase three trial. And that's the type of research that you do right before you submit to the FDA for approval of a drug or a device, showing that you have done a multi-site trial on a large number of people that's randomized and controlled in a very careful way to prove that you have some benefits beyond what the treatment is itself. And we've completed that for ADHD. Can you explain what it is, how it's improving the brain? Is it strengthening your ability to filter out information or is it strengthening another part of the brain that allows you to concentrate? And that could be slightly different um, processes in the brain. That's a great question. They actually are different processes um, and we have a lot of papers. As a matter of fact, one of my early claims to fame was separating the processes around focus and ignoring and showing that they're not two sides of the same coin. We're still trying to figure out the mechanism of action at that level of detail. We don't really know. We're doing those mechanistic studies now. What we can tell looking behaviorally is that the benefits are that when you go into a really boring environment, being given a challenge 
on your vigilance, on your ability to sustain your attention, even though it's so boring, there's no rewards, there's no colors, you get better at that. You get better at holding your attention, even in an environment that you don't want to be in that's very boring. And that is what we see behaviorally. What we see in the brain is that the neural networks involving the prefrontal cortex, the most evolved part of our brain that allows us to pay attention, and its network with the rest of the brain is engaged at a higher level and it's engaged earlier. Trying to understand all the details around, is this better focus, is this better ignoring, is this better switching between tasks? These are some of the detailed studies that we're doing now. Adam Ghazali is a neuroscientist at the University of California, San Francisco. So evidence supports the idea that we can improve our brains when we target regions for improvement and provide them with certain well-designed experiences. But if you're still craving a serious brain upgrade, find out just what that might entail. Also how evolution can guide us and what works to keep our faculties sharp, next. It's our monthly look at critical thinking on Big Picture Science, Skeptic Check, brain gain. Okay, we can understand if you're reluctant to completely abandon all hope that one day we can create a drug or some high-tech device that will give us amazing advanced cognitive abilities. A true smart drug, a brilliance booster, Mensa medicine. Well, I'm with you. Our final question to neuroscientist Amy Arnston addresses that blue sky thought. Okay, put aside what we can do now. Just what would it take to do this? You're asking, since we're in the realm of science fiction, to produce supranormal cognitive abilities. So not just us at our best, but us beyond our best. To make Einsteins out of a regular person. And that really would require not only making new neurons, but having them precisely connected in the right way. That is a great challenge. This is an exclusive product. It's coming on stream next year. They've had clinical trials and it's FDA approved. What's in it? They've identified these receptors in the brain that activate specific circuits. And you know how they say that we can only access 20% of our brain? Well, what this does, it lets you access all of it. So in movies like the science fiction, again, we're talking science fiction for just a moment, movie Limitless, where the protagonist pops a pill and then he has, they say, access to all of his brain, not just a limited percentage of his brain power, that truly is fiction. Yeah, so this arises from the myth that we only use 10% of our brain, which I think came from Einstein. And so since it came from him, we believed it, even though, of course, he was speaking metaphorically and knew nothing of neuroscience. We use all of our brains. And so there is no such thing as a pill that unlocks that vast 90%. We are usually using most of our brains. We should never say never, but if you're hanging around for a genius drug to go to clinical trial, you might as well pre-order a nuclear-powered hoverboard while you're at it, because both will arrive at about the same time. Well, maybe the hoverboard first. But speaking of technology, what if it's part of the problem? As we consider some final ideas on how to help our brains, just a quick thought about the digital world. After all, its relentless stream of information has contributed to our wish for more efficient brains in the first place. Maybe one thing that will help us is not the new thing that we start doing, but the thing that we stop doing all day, saturating ourselves with digital input. It has been associated with everything from depression to anxiety. Uh, recently, actually just a couple of days ago, a paper came out in JAMA about its association with ADHD symptoms. Okay, so if we come back to the um, thesis here of how to improve our minds, what happens if we start employing that filter more strictly on our digital devices and we put them away, maybe we don't look at them as often, we try not to multitask, uh, will we see an improvement in our cognitive function? And if so, in what areas? I think we will see an improvement. I think you'll see it in every areas. I think that you could see potentially the benefits on your work, on your safety, you might sleep better, you might have better relationships. You know, because the impact 
is so broad, the potential benefits are so great at taking some control and, and bringing on a filter. But the devil's in the details. It's easy to say this and recognize that you maybe have an issue with your digital devices. <laughs> Implementing a strategy is really important to deal with it because it's just not like, okay, I get it, this is bad, I'm gonna stop doing it. The draw is very strong. And so you actually have to build up these abilities of sustained attention and you know maybe delaying gratification that you don't get those rewards of new little nuggets of information all the time. And so the first part is recognizing it and limitations of our brain and how technology might be usurping some of your control over how you would like to interact with the world around you. And then coming up with a strategy to rebuild new habits that allow you to use technology in a more appropriate way. Don't despair if you choose to break up with your smartphone. There are ways to fill up the time you save and help your brain. Go for a walk, eat a salad, go to bed early. Well, if you do these things, you'll be falling back on the lessons learned in the longest running cognitive R&D program the world has ever seen. Our brains have been shaped by evolution. Here are five activities that have helped them stay fit. They're not sexy or outlandish enough to inspire a science fiction thriller, but they were mentioned repeatedly by the scientists and the science journalists that we talked to. Got your pen out? Physical exercise, cognitive challenge, including social activity, stress management, sleep management, and nutrition. Take it from a neuroscientist who does all of these. Yep, all of them. Um, just before this interview, I was in the gym. You know, I spend a lot of time. My diet is not perfect, but I do pay as much attention to it. I navigate as much as possible to the Mediterranean diet because I like it, and there's a lot of data for it. It's not perfect data. The nutritional data is the most difficult. Cognitive challenge, I got that pretty much uh, in spades, given what I do for, for a living. And, you know, stress is a really interesting one. The idea is not to have no stress. Our brains and bodies do not like comfort. We respond to challenge. What you want to avoid is that hopeless, helpless, chronic stress. That is negative, and there's lots of data to show how that even degrades our brain. But a little stress, not being completely passive, is critical. And then I'm also not perfect at any of these, and this one in particular is sleep. I mean, sleep is not subtle. Sleep is critical for everything we do. And because we often don't remember it and it feels like, you know, free time, we don't always give it the highest priority, but it certainly deserves it. And finally, while we're scrambling to figure out how to improve our brains, let's not lose sight of their remarkable abilities, the result of 10,000 generations of evolution. What has allowed us to survive as a species is our brains, our minds, and a very important part of that is our adaptability. Physicist and polymath Leonard Mladenov has taken a detour from his usual research turf, theoretical physics, to investigate and write about neuroscience and our brain's remarkable ability to be nimble. His book, Elastic, Flexible Thinking in a Time of Change, considers the trait that most strongly separates us from the other animals. Well, we have two kinds of thinking. One is the analytical logical thinking, which we have more than most animals, and that is a kind of analysis that allows us to deal with situations we've come into contact with before according to whatever paradigm or algorithm that we've learned or figured out on our own. And the other is elastic thinking, which comes from a unique talent that humans have, or I should say almost unique because uh, black and white isn't a good thing to talk about in uh, when you talk about neuroscience, but a uniquely great ability to generate new ideas and to generate new ways of looking at things, certain parts of our brain that are very good at that. And it's related to our language ability. It may even be that our great intelligence in this manner is a side product of our language ability, because when we speak, the words that we use do not have unique definitions. So if you imagine a given sentence, each word in that sentence can have many definitions. And so a sentence is like a puzzle that your brain has to figure out in real time as the person speaking by the context as the words come one after another, what the proper meaning of each is. And this is all done by your unconscious mind. And it, neuroscientists have connected that to the same mental machinery that helps us solve puzzles and get new ideas. I don't think many people would disagree with this statement that children are less inhibited about suggesting new ideas than adults. 
you know, a lot of them seem a little nutty, but I, I, you know, and I think your own mom occasionally scolds you for acting like a child, but you take it as a compliment. Uh, is it possible that children are more creative simply because they're less inhibited, or is it because their brains are wired a little differently? Well, those two are connected. So what happens inside your head is that on the unconscious level, whatever issue or problem you're facing, your brain is constantly proposing on the unconscious level many ideas for how to solve it and associations and thoughts from very reasonable ones to very odd ones. And you have what psychologists call cognitive filters that keep most of that from coming to your consciousness. If we didn't have those filters to cull through our ideas, we would drown in these crazy thoughts. And some people who have mental disorders do do that and have trouble functioning. But for a healthy person, those filters are working quite well and they keep the really crazy ideas out. But sometimes those crazy ideas or those odd ideas are the ones that we want because that's what we need to solve a problem. They're new, they're unconventional. So a lot of the methodology for enhancing elastic thinking or creative thinking or imagination or problem solving skills is learning how to loosen those filters. And kids have naturally loose filters because one of the main filters is something called your lateral prefrontal cortex. And your prefrontal cortex is the last part of your brain to mature and your lateral prefrontal cortex, which has certain cell structure, is the last part of the prefrontal cortex to mature. And it really doesn't mature until you're about 25. So your thinking before that is rather unfiltered, which is why kids can have wild thoughts, sometimes creative thoughts, sometimes just crazy thoughts, and also behavior, because it's not just thoughts, but it's behavior that gets filtered. Neuroscientists have recently discovered that the hippocampus, where memories and emotion are stored, do not grow new brain cells. So while the brain may continue to rewire itself, this part of the brain doesn't receive an influx of new neurons, as I understand it. So maybe we're limited to how elastic our thinking can be? Well, no, because elastic thinking has to do with rewiring the neurons that are there. Now, if neurons are dying away, it's nice to replace them, but you, you have 180 or 80 billion neurons, so you've got plenty. And what you need to do is get the right neural networks to work together. All the concepts you have, have of anything in life, your, anyone you know or any idea you have, is represented by a network of neurons, and these are intersecting networks, and they act together to form associations and thoughts. And so to change the way you think, you need to change the networks of the neurons that you have already and change the way they're interconnected. Well, finally, Leonard, we see elasticity in science, or at least as scientists, we like to think that there's elasticity in scientists. As scientists do come up with new ideas. I think the first thing that happens when they do that is uh, all their colleagues try and prove them wrong. But, uh, you know, with experiment, refinement, maybe they get proven right. Uh, do you think that there's kind of a, a lack of elasticity in society today more than there was, say, 100 years ago? Well, no, I think there's there's more elasticity today. People are forced to it. You are forced to behave differently because the society is changing around you. So everywhere that we go, because of the technology revolution, we're having to adapt and having to have some ability at least to adapt that's much greater than we were demanded to have 50 years ago or 30 years ago. Leonard Mladenov, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Thank you, Seth. Leonard Mladenov is a physicist, and he is the author of Elastic, Flexible Thinking in a Time of Change. So what we've heard in this Skeptic Check episode, you want a better brain, and there are plenty of products offering to help. But they and you have to deal with the fact that your brain resists change, homeostasis. So be realistic about what they can do. But there's good news, too. Your brain really is plastic. If you put in the effort, you can make an improvement. No magic pills, not yet, but a better brain is not impossible. Well, thanks to the participants in this show, Amy Arnston, a professor of neuroscience and psychology at Yale University, University of California neuroscientist Adam Ghazali, science journalist Caroline Williams, author of My Plastic Brain, One Woman's Year-Long Journey to Discover if Science Can Improve Her Mind, New York Times reporter Kevin Roos, and physicist Leonard Mladenov. Also, thanks to the brainy duo who are key in helping us to sound smart, senior producer Gary Niederhoff and operations manager Barbara Vance. 
We're also grateful for financial support from Rena Shulsky David and Sammy David and the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit scientific and education organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to our monthly look at critical thinking on Big Picture Science, Skeptic Check, Brain Gain. If you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science episodes, well, you'll find them in our archive at bigpicturescience.org, and you'll also find links there to our guests. Oh, and if you never want to miss an episode, subscribe to BiPiSci on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or iHeartRadio. Skeptic Check is brought to you thanks to a generous grant from the Trimberger Family Foundation. At the Trimberger Family Foundation, we hold that skepticism is a lamp that lights the way to truth. Trimberger.org.